Thank you very much, Debbie. Um, before I start, I just want to recognize a couple of important people on this topic uh, who are in the audience. Um, Ron Laub is in the fourth row, and he is waving his hand right now. He works part-time on light pollution issues for the University of Hawaii on this island. And sitting next to him is Ron, Lau uh, Ron Thiel, who's waving his hand right now. He's the county traffic engineer. So although we may seem to be on opposite sides of this subject, Ron and I have had a very productive working relationship. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about tonight uh, does relate to a lot of w the work that Ron is uh, involved in. So dark skies are, are critically important for astronomy. And I think I'm going to be showing you a lot of pictures showing, the, showing you that in much of the world, people are now growing up without ever seeing a dark sky, without ever seeing the Milky Way. And it's sort of sad that our children perhaps are growing up, maybe not on this island, but, but throughout much of the United States without ever seeing the Milky Way and, and some of the, the, the beauty of our universe. Every 10% brighter above the natural level that the sky becomes makes basic, makes the telescopes become 10% smaller. So if you think of if we allow the night sky to become 50% brighter over, on, on this island, the Keck telescope would be effectively 50% smaller, it would become a 5-meter telescope instead of a 10-meter telescope. We have the 30-meter telescope coming to this island, and it doesn't make any sense to bring it here if we have a poor sky, if we allow the sky to become bright and to weaken the telescope. So astronomers, more than anyone else, are very severely affected by light pollution. I always like to start with this picture, a different form of light pollution. That's not what we're talking about tonight, but um, that's a polluted light, but that's not the topic of tonight's talk. So I'm going to start with a, a short definition of, of light pollution. It's adverse effects of man-made lighting. So these include sky glow, glare, and I can demonstrate glare pretty easily by turning on some bright lights and pointing them at you like that. So you can't see me very well if, you're, if I'm behind these glary lights. So that's, what, that's glare. Energy waste. This is one of the places where astronomers can make a lot of headway because we can save money by using energy efficient lights and, and shining the lights down where it's needed. Light trespass. That's someone else's lights coming into your house or into your property. Decreased visibility at night. So if a light is, if it's a poor light, it may hinder your ability to see things and environmental harm. So I think in Hawaii, the place that is most sensitive in terms of environmental harm is the island of Kauai, where there are some endangered birds that, if they see a, an unshielded light, they'll fly around it and around it and around it until they become exhausted, and then they kind of drop to the, to the ground where they may die or where they may be eaten by a predator. Fairly recently, there was an issue on if National Geographic devoted to the subject of or the topic of light pollution. And on the front page of the National Geographic is the city of Chicago. And many of you may think that, that Las Vegas is the of the capital of light pollution, but but the, the capital is really Chicago. And it's a, that's a whole different lecture of how they got to that situation. Let's start with a little look at the Earth from space. And this happened basically in 1930. The mercury vapor lamp was invented. And from then on, society has lit the planet in ever-increasing amounts, and often quite carelessly. One of the things I always like to point out in this picture is the striking difference between South Korea and North Korea. 
I think it, it's not a measure of light pollution police or anything like that. It's a measure of economic uh, problems. But that, that's the most amazing disparity right there. From this satellite data, there was a, an, a world atlas of light pollution created. And if you look at the continent of Europe, you cannot find anywhere that is not light pollution, doesn't have light pollution. Everywhere in the entire continent is suffering from light pollution. If we look at the United States, there's a very distinctive line along the Mississippi. And east of the Mississippi, very severe light pollution. There were still some isolated pockets, sort of in Utah and Nevada, Colorado, where the, the, the night sky is, is pristine. If we look at Hawaii from space, this is an image, a satellite image from 2009. You can see Honolulu is dreadful. Um, there's Maui. Um, the observatories are located here, so Haleakala and Mauna Kea. And Kauai has rather good lighting. In fact, it's sort of, apart from the spectrum of the lights that they have there, the lighting is sort of an astronomer's dream. Every single street light on the island is fully shielded. So all the light from the street lights goes down. And they have just replaced all of their sports lighting with much better shielded lighting because of the problems with the birds. So the Federal Endangered Species Act has very sharp teeth, much sharper teeth than astronomers have. And they have absolutely excellent lighting on the island of Kauai. We'll talk a little bit about energy waste. So light shining upwards and outwards is wasted. The light should be, sh should be shining down into the area where it's being used. Every year, about $2 billion in the US, and this is before the oil price went up, is wasted. And we all know that electricity is very, very expensive in Hawaii. So this is a photo I took from Honolulu looking down. And when you think about it, every single one of those lights that you see there shouldn't be shining up into, the, into space. And you can take a simple light meter and measure the city's or the, the wasted electricity bill. And just from the lights that you see here in this picture, about half a million dollars per year is being wasted. Most of the talk, because of the relationship to astronomy, is going to be about sky glow. So sky glow is artificial brightening of the night sky due to city lights. And it decreases your ability to see the night sky. For astronomers, it makes it more difficult to see faint objects. It makes our telescope smaller. And it makes some observations impossible. An extreme case of sky glow you can think of is, is daytime. The stars are still there. You just can't see them because the sky is too bright. So why does this happen? If we were in space, so if you're an astronaut looking out at the sky, there is no sky glow because there's no air, there's no atmosphere. There, there are two mechanisms that, that cause the sky glow to occur. One of them is that air molecules temporarily absorb the light and then re-emit it. So they, a, a, a photon of light or a little light particle comes along, air molecule grabs it, holds on for it, to a little, for a little bit, and then it spits it out. But it's forgotten the direction it came from, and it sends it out in a different direction. And this is called Rayleigh scattering, and it's named after Lord Rayleigh, who was the person who, the physicist in, last cent in two centuries ago who quantified it. And this Rayleigh scattering is very, very color dependent. So blue light scattered, is scattered much more by the air than red light. And it's this phenomenon that makes the daytime sky blue, and the same phenomenon that makes our sunsets red. The other mechanism is, is particles in the atmosphere. And 
So that scattering is called me scattering, and that's things like aerosols and so on in the atmosphere. And that's not so strongly wavelength dependent. So which kind of scattering do we have on this island? If you have clear air, which we don't have today, the dominant scattering is Rayleigh scattering. So today, the atmosphere is absolutely loaded with VOG, and the dominant mechanism for the scattering right now is this me scattering or the particulate scattering. If you're up at the telescopes on Mauna Kea, the dominant scattering is almost always the Rayleigh scattering because the air is really clear up there and all of the VOG is nearly always trapped down in the lower parts of the atmosphere. I'm going to quickly show you a little demonstration of what this sky glow does. So this is a, a photo of the night sky seen from Mauna Kea. This is the center of our galaxy and that is one of the, the Keck telescopes here. If I take the same camera, same exposure into my backyard in Kailua on Oahu, instead of that, I see this. And the light is coming dominantly from street lights. If I take the same camera across the mountains closer to Honolulu and try to see stars, I see that. So you're very lucky on this island because you can you'll see this. But you cannot see that from Oahu. It's gone. And this view of the Milky Way is in the southern sky. That's where all the lights are on Oahu. It's impossible to see from Oahu. It's gone forever, probably. So a little homework for you. And this is a little more challenging because you have a dark sky on this island. But I give this homework to my students at, U at University of Hawaii. And I ask them to try to estimate how many stars they can see. And I don't, I don't want you to go home and try to count and count and count, because that's going to take you a long time. And when you get to about 500, you probably lose count and you have to start again. So I'll give you a little trick to try to count the stars and, and see how, how it is where you live. So if you extend your, your, your arm like this in a sort of normal shaka type configuration, the angle between your, th your thumb and your pinky is about 20 degrees. And if you make a square on the sky with your shaka, or one square shaka, that's about 400 square degrees. So try to count how many stars is in, uh, you can see in one square shaka. And there are 50 square shakas in the sky. So whatever you count in one, you can multiply by 50. So if I have my students do this in Honolulu, especially like on a UH campus, they do this, and they can't find any. So they kind of have to do a few of these to find one or two stars. So you should be able to find about 40 stars in one square shaka. You should be able to see about 2,000 stars. For, for normal, normal eyes. It's particularly dark on this island, and maybe you can see more, and I hope you can. But the darkest sky on Oahu is about one and a half times brighter than it is here. And that's on the north shore, not on the south shore. And if you go out at night, on a dark night, and again, it's not tonight, it's cloudy, and there's a full moon, so go on a dark night, and stare up at the sky sometime shortly after sunset. And if you look carefully, this is one photo, you'll start to see a whole lot of things in the sky. So you see here is a satellite. And here is another one. There's another one. So if you get in a dark place, you'll find the sky is full of satellites and other things. And if you get lucky, you'll see a meteor like this. But see, there's another satellite right here, too. So the sky is just loaded with satellites if you get in a dark place, and you can see them whizzing by. There's a little cluster of stars called the Beehive Cluster. And then when it gets a little bit darker, you'll start to see this band of light here. This is looking to the west right after sunset. 
And it gets darker still. You see this? This is called the zodiacal light. And this is dust left over from collisions of asteroids and, so, and, and from comets that are orbiting around the sun. This is the planar, the ecliptic, the place where the um, zodiac constellations are. You cannot see this unless you're in a very dark location. And with your naked eye, you can even see some of the nearby galaxies. There's M31, M33. Can't do this from Honolulu. Can't do this from a place that has a lot of light pollution. Can't really do it properly from even from Maui because they don't have a strong lighting ordinance there. If you point your camera to the south, you see all the stars rotating past. Or in fact, the earth is turning and the stars are staying still. Down here is the volcano underneath the clouds. This is a Gemini telescope up on top of Mauna Kea. So we right now still have a really dark sky above Mauna Kea and we need to keep it dark. So in 1989, there was a strong lighting ordinance enacted. It was modified a little bit, and I'll talk about that later in 2011. The enforcement of the lighting ordinance is fairly poor. Mauna Kea is also protected by its altitude. It's very high up. It's above 40% of the atmosphere. So this Rayleigh scattering by air molecules is diminished because there isn't so much air above it. Between 1985 and 1989, all of the mercury vapor lamps on this island were replaced by low pressure sodium lights. And these are the characteristic amber or orangey colored lights you'll see in common uses for street lights in this island. And the, for many years, astronomers benefited from this because these lights were very, very energy efficient. They were the most energy efficient light available. That's changing now, and I'll talk about that shortly. We're not the only place with these low pressure sodium lamps. They're also in use on Oahu, chosen for their energy efficiency. They're used in the Canary Islands. And in other places, the astronomers didn't manage to convince the local authorities to use the low pressure sodium. So in Chile, it's mostly high pressure sodium. So it's still a sodium based light, but it's a little bit different color. And I have a little demonstration of, of some of this. The sodium lighting doesn't scatter a lot through this Rayleigh scattering process because it's more towards the ready orange end of the spectrum rather than at the blue end of the spectrum. So I'm sure at these talks, some astronomers have shown you spectra in the past, and I'm going to limit it to very simple spectra. So this is what a so low-pressure sodium lamp looks like. It's a very pure color or monochromatic. It's very, very similar to the color of the amber traffic signal. In fact, it's indistinguishable. And for that reason, it's not a terribly good color in terms of road safety because you cannot tell the difference between the street light color and the amber traffic signal. And for that reason, the county traffic engineer wanted to get away from this type of light. And I have here an example of, of, of that. So this is basically the same color. I know it's probably really glary as the low pressure sodium. And the other light is the same color this, this one here, as the high pressure sodium. And I'll turn, turn them off because I can see people don't like looking at them. But, oops. So the high pressure sodium is still mostly kind of an orangey colored light, but it does have a little bit more light in the blue. It has a little bit col better color rendition. It doesn't look so much like a, an amber traffic signal. Low pressure sodium is ideal for astronomers because we can filter it out. It only affects one color in the spectrum. We can use filters to kind of block it out. 
It's also a color in the spectrum that is already ruined because there is sodium in the upper atmosphere deposited by micrometeorites that glows. And it's the same sodium layer in the upper atmosphere that the Keck laser points up at and makes it shine when they're doing their laser guides to our adaptive optics. The low pressure sodium bulb is not very good, how do you say? It's a long cylinder, it's very, very hard to direct the light. And the light fixtures are big and bulky. You've seen them hanging over the street here. It's hard to direct the light from the low pressure sodium. So it's, it's cheap to make the light from the low pressure sodium lamp, but it's hard to make it go where you want. And it kind of gets sprayed around all over the place. The county lighting ordinance, until recently, only required partial shielding of the low pressure sodium lamps. In retrospect, maybe that was a mistake, but in 1989, there were, really weren't any good properly shielded sodium light, low pressure sodium lights that directed the light downwards only. And also, the, the street lights are placed mostly on utility poles, not on kind of regularly engineered spacing. So they're really far apart, and it's very hard to achieve uniformity with the shielded lights. There are now some good fully shielded fixtures available. The street lights that were installed in 1985 to 1989 are reaching the end of their useful life, and there are about 10,000 of them. Over the last five years, as they have failed, there has been a slow migration to the properly shielded lights, and I'll show you some pictures of those, and I think probably about 20% are now prop fully shielded. I, I want to stress the importance of shielding. The reason why the shielding is, is so important is that the Earth's atmosphere is extremely thin. So you can think of the Earth's atmosphere as a very thin layer of air above us. If you draw a line from us 10 miles up, the atmosphere is almost gone. But if you take a, a line 10 miles horizontally, there's land there. It's not very far away in those terms. So if you think of a, you have a light and it's shining on the ground and then the light from that light is reflecting off of the ground, most of the light that's reflected off the ground and goes straight up is going to leave the atmosphere without causing any light pollution. The atmosphere is that thin. 80% of the light reflected off the ground going straight up is going to go away without doing any harm. But if you have a light that's shining ever so slightly above the horizontal, it's going to go and go and go through the atmosphere until eventually it hits a piece of dust or if it hits an air molecule and it's scattered. Basically, a 100% chance of a horizontally aimed beam of light scattering and causing light pollution. Here's a picture of fully shielded lights and partially shielded lights. There's an enormous difference in how glary they, this one is very glary compared to the fully shielded light. So in 2003, I decided, well, we had a, a, a colleague who became an astronaut. And NASA was starting to make some beautiful pictures of cities at night. And we tried through all the official channels to get some photos of Hawaii taken from the space station and completely failed. But then my colleague, who had become an astronaut, went up to the space station. And I learned how to send email to the space station and was very fortunate to get a couple of pictures of Hawaii taken for me in 2003. And this was the first quantitative look at where the sources of light pollution are, the dominant sources of light pollution. So I color-coded this, so the, the kind of this orangey color 
is natural. There's nothing we can do to turn the volcano off. The, and, and this is relatively faint, right? And in fact, I spotted these pictures and emailed Ed Liu, the astronaut at the space station. He hadn't spotted the lava in the pictures. And he was kind of psyched to, to see the, the pictures. So this is kind of what it would look like if you're an astronaut looking down at Earth from the space station. This photography is very difficult to do because the space station is moving around the Earth at 18,000 miles an hour. But it gave, it was, so it's not a perfect picture, gives us a lot of insight into where we need to put our efforts in, in light pollution. And we saw, for example, that some of these state facilities are bright. So Kona Airport, Hilo Harbor, Hilo Airport, very bright. And based upon the information we got from this, we were able to get new legislation that required the state to conform to county lighting ordinances at airports, harbors, and on highways. And that was a big step. There's a, a, a jurisdiction level in, in laws that the state didn't have to follow the county lighting ordinance, now they do. And you can see that Pahakaloa is not very bright, but because it's so close to Mauna Kea, it has a big impact on the observatory. And we've been working very closely with the army to keep the lighting there under control. And then in the blue is a, the, the sort of the county lighting. There's the city of, uh, town of Hilo, there's Kona, and Waikoloa, Waimea, where we are here now. If you look at, at Hilo from Mauna Kea, this is what you see. And you see that many of the lights are the old style partially shielded street lights. And many of the, because we can see the lights directly, that means they're sending their light directly into the air over the observatory. And this is something we want to see changed in the future. We want to see better shielded lights in the future. If we look from the summit to the northwest, we see Waimea. Um, we see the there's a, uh, we see the, the roadway with the car headlights, we see Waikoloa. We can see lights on Maui. We can even see Honolulu. So Honolulu is 300 kilometers or almost 200 miles away. And what I think, if you can try to imagine yourself as an air molecule somewhere above the observatory, if you go another five or 10,000 feet up, it's pretty likely that you can see Honolulu in all its glory. So Honolulu, even though it's a long way away, does contribute to light pollution over Mauna Kea. And we do have a, a bill in the state legislature this session that will try to start doing something with the lighting statewide. In, uh, it will start with some of the state lighting across the state. So, so schools and state facilities. And if we look towards the north, we can see Honoka'a. And I, sh I included this, this is a long time exposure, but you can see this is sports lighting. And sport, we're very sensitive to poorly shielded sports lighting. So this, this light here is coming from a sports facility in Honoka'a. This light pollution here is me driving around causing light pollution myself. So I'm sorry, I apologize. It makes a nice picture, but uh, and this is the um, this stray light coming out of the door when the observer steps outside to um, check the sky. So what do we have right now? And again, this is this is um, violet down at this end of the spectrum, and red color over here, yellow here. This is the night sky spectrum seen from Mauna Kea, it's pretty much natural light. So this is coming from the atmosphere itself. It's, most of this is not coming from the street lights. The street lights are buried in here. So part of that is natural, and part of that is coming from, from lights, from artificial lights. And we, unless we had a big switch, we can't easily how much of this is coming from the streetlights and how much of it is 
is um, natural. I want you to compare that to the spectrum from Lick Observatory in California near San Jose, near the city of San Jose. So Mauna Kea is the dotted line here, a good observatory site. And this solid line is the sky spectrum from the Lick Observatory. So this is now regarded as a place that's essentially ruined for optical astronomy. The sky is too bright. So you see characteristic signals of, of high pressure sodium, low pressure sodium, and mercury lighting here. This is probably four or five or six times as bright as Mauna Kea. So this is probably about the same as Oahu at that observatory. So what type of lights do we have on this island and what, what does the ordinance say? So street and parking lot lights are, are low pressure sodium of its characteristic amber orange color. Where more color rendition is needed, for example at the airports, on the apron lighting, it's mostly high pressure sodium, which is still okay. Metal halide lamps, which is kind of a, sort of like a modern better mercury lamp are used for sports field and they're used in, in car sales. But curfews apply. So they're not allowed to be used beyond about 11 o'clock at night. They have to be switched over to low pressure sodium unless the business is still open late at night. And the big thing, the big change in lighting is solid state lighting or light emitting diodes. I'm sure many of you have heard about these. You may have started to experiment with them in your house. They're not yet in common use. The LEDs nearly all have more blue and green light than the sodium based light sources. So that presents a problem to astronomers because we have this extremely dark sky in the blue and in the green that we want to try to preserve. the energy efficiency of these light emitting diodes has been rapidly improving. So a few years ago, salespeople were coming and saying how wonderful they are. At that point, they were sort of a little bit lying. Now, they're not lying anymore. They're basically as efficient or almost as energy efficient as low pressure sodium. Low pressure sodium, I think, has it's days numbered. Nobody other than, it's, it's basically out of favor as a light source throughout the world. There's only one factory making the bulbs anymore. And quite frankly, I think it's days are numbered. So we're in a little bit of a problem. And I think the, the future is probably light emitting diodes. So the salespeople have been hyping up how efficient the LEDs are and telling you how much more energy efficient they are than low pressure sodium. They, aren't, they don't produce more light per watt than low pressure sodium. The only way to save energy with an LED is to make less light and to use the light that you make intelligently and direct it only where you want it to go. So you have to use very, very efficient light fixtures with LEDs. So just about every LED that you will come across is basically producing their light from a blue LED or blue light emitting diode and a phosphor. You will probably have seen the blue LEDs as the taxiway lights at the airport or if you're driving too fast as the blue light on the police car that's chasing you. If you put a phosphor in front of the blue, LED, it will convert some of the blue light into green and red and the other colors of the spectrum. The problem for astronomers is that this native blue emission, it sort of looks a bit like this, is at a wavelength where your eye isn't very sensitive, but our telescopes are very sensitive. And this color 
Remember the Rayleigh scattering and the color of the sky? This is scattered a lot by the atmosphere. So this is, these are bad news for astronomers. Good news for the county because they can save some money. So we had quite a, little, quite a lot of debating, shall we say, with Ron and, and, and trying to come to a solution that was acceptable to both of us. These light emitting diodes, if you go to the Home Depot or try to buy one, um, they don't look anything like a black body, which is sort of how usually we, we measure a spectrum or how we quantify it with a temperature. But anyway, the lighting industry has attached temperatures to these, and I have three of them here, and I'm going to show you the, turn them all on. And I hope you can see the different colors. I know it's going to kind of be glary. So the one on this side is five to 6,000. This one here is 4,200. And this one here is 2,800. So I'm going to turn them off because I know I'm kind of blinding you. But I want to talk a little bit about this. So the bluest one, the one that is the, the worst for astronomy, is basically you want to use that if you want to turn nighttime into daytime. It's the same color as daylight. 4,200 Kelvin is about the same color as moonlight. And remember that we as a species have evolved with night and day. And night didn't have this 5,000 or 6,000 Kelvin. The most we ever had until the invention of the light bulb was a candle or something much cooler than, even than 2,800 Kelvin. So this shift to blue rich has on, is only recent and all species on the planet have never encountered, they've encountered moonlight but only for half of the night and they had never in, encountered daylight in the middle of the night. Salesmen like these because they're most energy efficient. Luckily, these have become much more efficient. They're almost the same efficiency as these now. So just to look at the spectra of these, um, this is the native emission of the light emitting diode, and this is emission from the phosphor. And you see that the LEDs produce almost no light at all of this color, sort of this greeny blue color, none at all. And the lack of this color for some people makes the, the LED light source a little bit disagreeable. If we look at this and compare it to the sensitivity of the eye, you can see that the eye is really not very good at all for this blue emission. Very good here for the phosphor emission. I want a quick demonstration of this. So my, this photopic curve, this green laser is, is this wavelength here. And this red laser, which is much less bright, if I put them next to each other, you can see how much brighter the green is. They're the same power, just your eye isn't nearly as sensitive to the red as it is to the green. So the, gr the red is here and the green is here. There's, there's the, this, this curve. So the eye is much more sensitive to this sort of green and yellow light than it is to red or it is to blue. So the blue emission doesn't contribute much in terms of human vision. Most people don't like the high color temperature. You know, these really bluish headlights, how glary they are. Probably fine if you're driving the car that has them, but your car is making it hard for other people to see. Blue light is more harmful to many species, such as turtles, and the blue light may cause your eye's iris to contract. So it's defeating the purpose of lighting if everybody's eyes are, iris is contracting and they're allowing less light to enter the eye. 
Generally, nobody likes the high color temperature LEDs. There's a little quote here where they say, zombie blue is exactly right, like a day for night special effect in a vampire movie. The test street lights create the sort of atmosphere where you almost expect the undead to emerge from the flower beds and begin eating your face. So I didn't write this. This is from Seattle, where they tested this 5,000 Kelvin lights. Blue light regulates melatonin production in all advanced forms of, of animal life. And melatonin regulates the day-night cycle in animals, and excessive amounts of blue light disrupt our circadian rhythm. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this. There's a probably a whole lecture on this that someone else better qualified than me can give you. I will just note that shift work has been recognized as a probable carcinogen by the World Health Organization. That's based upon messing with your circadian rhythm. Human breast cancer cell growth has been shown to be modified by exposure to light. They did some experiments with human breast cancer, women exposed to, to light and had some cell, uh, breast cancer cells in rats and they kind of plumbed the, the blood into the rats or fed the, rat, the cancer cells in the rats with the human blood. It's probably about as far as you can go with that research without hurting people. And research in Israel now recently has linked higher levels of breast cancer to areas that have more light. The lighting industry hates this stuff. It's got a little bit of the same feeling to me as, as the tobacco industry and secondhand smoke. So this blue light is a big problem. Um, the International Dark Sky Association had a, a sort of a meeting of cross-disciplinary experts. They recommended if you're going to use white light to keep the color temperature down, keep the, 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 the blue light under control. So switching back to this island, um, I worked with, with Ron Thiel. The criteria for, for lighting the intersections with traffic signals, Ron wanted a different color to red, amber, or green traffic signal. He wanted high energy efficiency, needed to reduce the, 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 the electricity bill by 50% or more. I needed to minimize the damage to astronomy, and you all needed that as well. Keck needs that, all the, the astronomers needed that. To do that, we try to minimize the photons detected at the telescope per lumen, for lumen is the useful light emitted on this, onto the, the roadway or the area where you're, being, where you're lighted, lighting. And fully shielding the light fixtures is absolutely necessary. So the way that this has been done is that we have We took this high color temperature white LED that we or astronomers hate and filtered it. We took the blue light out. So I don't know if you can see how much light is taken out. Hardly, it's hardly any in terms of the amount of light, but that's what the filter is doing. So we go from, from this to this. So there are 14 prototype fixtures installed in Hilo. The light output is cut by more than 50%. The light distribution is much better controlled. And the um, energy usage is about 85 watts instead of 180 watts. And I have some photos of these if you haven't been to Hilo and seen them. The resultant light is kind of greenish color. You can see here. Um, very little blue, but all the other colors in the spectrum. These have much, much better color rendition than the, the low pressure sodium, which you see here. 
And you can see at the edge of the road, there's no light. So the light is going onto the road and onto the road only. There's no wastage of light. Well, you see here, the sodium light is being sprayed out everywhere. It's spraying out all over the place, much less light control. You see it again here, the LED lighting, very tight light control on the roadway, low pressure sodium is sprayed out of all over the place. We do a, a check of the traffic signals, there's a green traffic light, amber traffic light, and you see now there's the confusion with the low pressure sodium, it's green, amber, red. So here's the spectrum of this filtered light emitting diode. Not very much blue light at all. Basically we cut this blue light that is causing all the trouble and we have green, yellow and red light. So it has much better color rendition than low pressure sodium. So these are very much in your future. Um, about a half a million dollars came from economic stimulus money will be used to, s to replace about 1,000 streetlights within about 400 meters of signalized intersections and also at crosswalks. In order to get this money, they had to save a lot of energy, and most of the lights that are going to be replaced are the big 180 watt, the ones that are like this big, low pressure sodium lamps. In terms of impact on astronomy, the low pressure sodium does have a little bit less impact on astronomy. But if the total amount of light that is produced is, is reduced, then the impact on astronomy can be, can be uh, with, with, by, by use of the, the filtered LED, can be less than with low pressure sodium. Now, you're all very conscious that the population of this island is continuing to grow quite rapidly. So we need, in order to sustain astronomy, to keep the sky dark over Mauna Kea, we need a solution that not only controls light pollution, but reduces light pollution for the future. So the tremendous advantage that the light emitting diodes have over low pressure sodium is the directionality of the light. The light is used only to use the light the roadway or the parking lot. It's not sprayed out into adjacent lots. It's not lighting people's yards. It's going only, only being used for the task required. And this produces an opportunity on this island to replace all of these dated, partially shielded lights with fully shielded lights. But careful when they're, when they're installed, because they're fully shielded, you can't tip them on their side. So this careful alignment and leveling of these fully shielded lights is, is very important. And the cost of electricity on this island, I'm sure you're all aware, is very high. And street lights are costing about, maybe an out-of-date figure, about one and a half million a year. The light emitting diodes probably will require less maintenance. The only way that this, the county can save money with light emitting diodes is to make less light. So as soon as an astronomer hears less light, they're very happy. So nowhere I ever try to give the message to get rid of light, but the message is use only light where you need it, when you need it, and don't use more light than you need. And we're going to win because the direct up light from the partially shielded lights will go away. A little twist in this is that since this light was, was produced, the cool, sorry, the warm, the efficiency of the warm LED has dramatically improved. And we now have an, an alternative, which is this light. So this is a, the same filter, but instead of using the, the cool white or the blue, very blue rich LED, this is using a different one. So, we, so this is an alternative, this is a filtered warm LED. And if you can kind of remember, I can't plug them both in at the same time. Try to think, try to compare that to 
this one, which is the, the more greenish one. So astronomers, I think, pretty strongly prefer, if I can find my plugs right, prefer this one because it has less green light. And remember that the, the, the green part of the spectrum and the blue part of the spectrum is extremely dark and very, very precious to astronomers. Light emitting diodes can be controlled. So the amount of light can be reduced and it is something that I think continues to be thought about. So if you can cut the light down by a factor of two for half of the night, you can save even more energy. You can't turn the LPS down to half the, half the brightness. A few issues, we, these LEDs have only really been in existence for a few years, so we don't know how well they'll perform. We're told that they will live for 10 to 20 years with no maintenance, but there are none that have been in use for 10 to 20 years, sort of almost by definition. So this degradation of this phosphor, which is producing all of the useful light, would be a major problem if it occurs. I don't worry too much about this because maybe in five years' time, the LEDs will be significantly more efficient. There is a theoretical maximum. They're not going to go, they're not going to be 10 times as efficient, and probably they can't get much more than two times as efficient than, compared to where they are now. So there may be economic benefits from replacing these in five to 10 years. Other things that would be very desirable to address in the lighting ordinance are to cut down on the blue light where we do allow the white light. So businesses really don't need blue rich white light and buildings or architectural lighting certainly doesn't need a lot of blue to light up a building. On this island, you are not allowed to use a mercury lamp, which is very damaging to the observatory, but you can buy one. So you can buy it, but you can't use it, but obviously people are buying them and using them. And the Keck telescopes can see mercury in their spectra and continue to see mercury. I mean, it's at a low level, it's not killing astronomy, but it would be good to just stop this use of the mercury lamps. We had a, a few little scares when some of the hotels started to explore gas lighting. Gas, fossil fuel lighting is, is exempt from any shielding in the present lighting ordinance. There are still a lot of really old fixtures. Some of these styles that, it's kind of these globe lights that send more of their light up than they than do down. It would be good to get rid of those. And it would be good to explicitly prohibit the illumination of rooftops. That's just a form of advertising. It's implicitly prohibited in the lighting ordinance, but I think it, we all know it happens, and it would be good to stop it. And I don't think it's doing any astronomy any good to shine a searchlight at the observatory. Enforcement is kind of lax. Um, much of the enforcement right now seems to be people calling Ron Laub and Ron going and talking to them and sometimes succeeding and, and sometimes not. There are some teeth in the lighting ordinance, there are some penalties, but I don't know that the penalties have ever really, no, no one's really ever played hardball on this. So I think more enforcement and w would be really a good, good idea. And some of the changes when we, when we introduce light emitting diodes involve technical things, things like spectral power distribution. Some of the spectra I'm showing you, it starts to get a little more technical and that also presents a little bit of an enforcement challenge because then the person who's enforcing has to be able to do measurements. At the state level, there is a, now a committee that I am the chair of. Uh, it's called the Starlight Reserve Committee was established by the 2009 legislature, and we've been produced a bill that is being co considered by this legislature. It's probably about to go to conference committee to kind of iron out differences between the House version and the Senate version. 
Locally, there is some new lighting. Uh, the, these are very good, very well shielded lights going in, in Waimea at the sports field. And uh, we're very pleased to see this very well shielded type of recreational light being used by the county. And now I'm gonna show you something that I think only four people may have seen. Um, very recently, I was able to get some new photos of the Big Island from the space station. And these cameras have come a long way since 2003, and we're still trying to digest this a little bit, but I'll try to lead you through what you're seeing here. This is the, the Kona area here. This is the Kona airport. So again, airport is, is very bright. And so that's the, where the air, airplanes are parked, the ramp area, and that's the rental car area at the airport. There's a lot of non-conforming lights or illegal lights at the airport car rental area. I think that's Hualalai. I think there is a cloud over Waikoloa village. Um, this is the, the Waikoloa resort area here. And that is Waimea. And that is Honoka'a and Harvey up here. And I think that's Kayaho here and then going down towards the south. So that's the, the west side of the island. Again, this is a, you have to know someone who knows someone. So these photos were taken by an uh, astronaut called Don Pettit. He's the original astronaut who developed this ground tracking system they have on the space station where they originally they were using a Makita drill to compensate for the motion of the space station so they could track on the, on, on the, on the ground. So they have a much, much better camera now. So this is Hilo, and there's the, the airport, there's the, the harbor area, and you can't see how bright it is, but there's a very, very bright light source here, which is the, the recreational area in Hilo. And this is sort of the commercial area going down south of the airport in Hilo. I don't know what that is. It might be the hospital, but I'm not, I haven't really had time to, to fully understand this. This is lava down here, and that is the town of Volcano, I believe. So I'm almost done. I wanted to, to close by inviting you all to, to try to, look, to watch this movie. So it's a movie, uh, the director is Ian Chaney. He also stars in the movie. Um, I helped him with some of the uh, filming on the Big Island, and I believe he also filmed Ron Thiel. Um, I do not appear in the movie. I appear on the cutting room floor only. Um, but these are the guys who made the film. There's Hilo behind it. Um, so it was shown in some cinema, sort of limited release. Keck could, dis could show it if there is enough interest, I think. Um, they can sort of purchase a DVD and do a public showing of the movie. It's about 80 minutes on this topic of light pollution. It does go into the human health stuff in a lot more detail than I had chance to today. And they interview some experts who did the research on the rats and on, on some of the epidemiology. Much better qualified people than me to talk about it. But it was filmed in Mauna Kea in 2008. It's part of it on Haleakala and a bunch of other places in the world. It's sort of one person's sort of quest to find the, a dark night sky. So he remembered what, he, what it was like when he was a kid and goes try and then sort of explores New York City, finds that he can't find, any, any, can't find the night sky and then goes to Arizona where there's some really, really hardcore amateur astronomers and talk to them, then comes to Hawaii and explores some of the the night sky from here too. So very strongly recommend that you uh, try to see that movie. I want to close with a couple of pictures of the zodiacal light. So again, to just to remind you all that you're very fortunate on this island to be able to see this. 
you don't need to go to Mauna Kea, you just need to get away from it, it's like city lights to see this. So go look at, for the Zodiaco light on the western horizon shortly after sunset, or on the eastern horizon, much harder to see, to get out of bed shortly before sunrise. So I would recommend the evening one, but it's, it's visible both sides of the sky. And if any of you follow the astronomy picture of the day, this is today's picture. And this again is the zodiacal light. And this is a kind of weird projection, but this is the zodiacal light seen from Mauna Kea. And you see it over here, that I think that's Hilo. This is looking to the, to the west. And this here, you see it goes all the way. It shows the plane of the ecliptic. These are the zodiac constellations. And right in the middle is a very special part of the zodiacal light called the Gegenschein. And that is only visible from an extremely, extremely dark place like Mauna Kea. Thank you.